Good afternoon uh, and welcome uh, to our discussion uh, on the economic dimensions uh, of the Cyprus settlement. This evening we have uh, with us uh, again, once again, Dr. Klerchos Kiriagidis, head of our institute's law and democracy uh, program, Klerchos, and Dr. Aris Pedasis, uh, an expert in international business management, Aris. Thank you. Uh, just before we start, I, I need to say that both all uh, parties uh, here speak on their own uh, individual capacity and not on behalf of any organization which they belong to. Gentlemen, uh, we hear that a peace dividend is at hand. If only we can solve the Cyprus problem. What's your response? First of all, let me thank uh, Erpik for inviting me to the <laughs> program. And I uh, hope we can give some valuable information to our uh, viewers in the next uh, 45 or so minutes. Now, peace dividend. I read the report in which an attempt is made to basically beautify the bizonal solution as being in, to the economic benefit of the people. But I do have this major observation on the whole exercise. In my capacity as a consultant, I know one thing, that if I go to my clients and I give them anything which does not rest on logical and sound assumptions, they will not take my work seriously. So I'm afraid this exercise on the peace dividend sits on some airy-fairy assumptions that don't make any sense, basically, to me. And they assume that everything is going to be but let, let me ask you specifically, because, uh, look, I, in fact, uh, we're not going to refer to any particular report uh, per se, uh, but there are, have been a number of reports, and they all, uh, they're done by reputable people, they're done by economists and so yeah. on, and uh, the end result is, uh, as far as they're calculating, uh, that there are certain benefits uh, flowing out of a settlement. And I'll give you some examples and you okay. can comment on them. All right. uh, first of all, there, there will be uh, a compensation for the refugees, a compensation, either a return to their properties or cash compensation and so on. So uh, there will be a cash infusion, let's say, into the economy. That's one thing. Uh, then, uh, the, because of the peace, there will be, or they're predicted to be, large foreign investments, yeah. uh, both uh, institutional investments, but also from the general public. Uh, a third one is uh, a foreign debt reduction, because there's uh, suggestions and promises by both the European uh, community and other parties, including Turkey, that uh, suggesting that they will give the new uh, federal government a stipend in the sense of reduction of debts and so on. Um, more than that, uh, they suggested that there will be an equalization of the two communities, an economic equalization. Um, there's going to be a huge trade boom. Uh, one thing that's going to happen is that the, the huge market of Turkey will open for, the, for Cypriot businesses, both in the north and in the south. Uh, and also in the, on the horizon is the hydrocarbon bonanza. So all of these things will happen uh, faster more efficiently because of the settlement? Well, Your I don't comment. know where to start because you have uh, put forward plenty of uh, hay on our fork. <laughs> I'll start with the compensation. One of the reports, f first of all, n not just one of the reports, but all the reports that are written and have been written have been challenged by me through articles in the press. I asked them to give me the assumptions under which they are working. Because any study on, in our area rests on assumptions. If you assume, for example, that the government is going to be run with vetoes, it's one assumption. 
If you assume that the government is going to run freely on democratic principles, like all the countries in the European Union, especially the Western uh, European countries, it's another story altogether. Now, on the compensation, the last study I saw that was uh, had... Uh, so, so basically you're raising the question of whether the political system is going to be efficient and run efficiently or not. And that's one of the qualifications that you put down, right? The qualification is as follows. No, I've heard you. I don't have to repeat it, but move, <laughs> then move, move to the next Okay, one. okay. So, you either have democracy and you've got a good economy, right. or you either have partition called by zonal and you don't have an economy. That's my, my understanding of things. Now, compensation. First of all, one of the reports that was written, plus the, other, the, the one previously written by Kebe, they avoid the issue of compensation. And they say that this is not part of the scope of the study. Why do they avoid it? They avoid it because the numbers don't tally. If you take the occupied areas and what uh, the Turkish state, because it's going to be a Turkish state, it's not going to be a Turkish Cypriot state, the Turkish state will have, it will have roughly 3,000 square kilometers of land under its uh, own uh, jurisdiction. Now, if you start compensating, ju just think of 3,000 square kilometers of land and start thinking of compensation of the owners. The moment you get into that, we are talking about 40 or maybe 50 billion euros of compensation. But doesn't it depend on what the value that's going to be ascribed to the exchange you, of okay. uh, properties and so on? Of, co of it's course. It's not just compensation, it's exchange, it's... Uh, okay, if let's you go, remember, yeah. there's 22 c categories yeah, yeah, okay. of ownership but that, that let's we're not, discussing. Le let's not confuse ourselves with categories. The issues are very simple. In the occupied area, 90% of, of the properties belong to Greek Cypriots. That's the end of it. I didn't know that it was that high. Oh, absolutely. 70% yeah. of private property, but 90% of property, including uh, church property and so on, belongs to the Greek Cypriots. So we are talking now about 90% of 3,000 square kilometers to be compensated. I don't think anyone can compensate. Now, if we come now to the free areas controlled by the government, roughly 80% of the property belongs to Greek Cypriots and 20% belongs to Turkish Cypriots. So even if you have an exchange, figures don't tally. That's why they avoid this issue, all these studies. They don't make this assumption that I told you, what's going to be the compensation and how they're going to value the land. So if we take the median value of land in the free territories versus the, free, the median value of the new Turkish territory, then you will see that any sensible calculation will not be less than 40 billion, which is roughly 200% of the combined GDP of the free areas plus the occupied areas now, as they stand now. Okay, that sounds uh, okay. quite yeah. high. But the one yeah. suggestion is that there, there's going to be grants from international organizations. There are going to be grants from the United States and so on. Okay. People are going to give us uh, money in order to uh, implement the settlement. We can talk. W will that not be enough to, to cover the difference? Uh, you, you're suggesting that it won't. Not in, when we start talking about countries coming giving us money free, I think we live in cloud cuckoo land. Because last time we needed 8 billion euros to keep our banking system on its feet. This is back in 2013 you're talking and about. Nobody helped. Yeah, b b back in 2013. <laughs> yeah. And we didn't get a single penny. When Verhoegen was here, and he was trying to promote with all sorts of uh, propaganda the Anand plan, he went to the donors' conference, <coughs> and he managed to get, I think, 67 or 65 million euros as pledges. Million or billion? Million. With an M. Yeah, the mother. with an M. Okay. As pledges. So the moment you hear that somebody is pledging 67, assume seven, because the other 60 will never come. So who is going to, in other words, is somebody saying that the American government will go to Congress because you need congressional approval and parliamentary approval and to tell them that Cyprus wishes to have an anomaly and they are asking us to pay for the anomaly mm. and the American um, uh, Congress will come and give money 
to the American government to compensate us. The moment, at this moment as we talk now, there are 80,000 veterans from Iraq mm. that are homeless and they are living under bridges. And they have uh, ab about 22,000 okay. that live below the... What about the International the Monetary Fund? The International Monetary Fund is business is not to give money. Its business is to lend money to countries that are in distress. Well, they'll lend us money. Who is going to pay it back? Le let's go back to the lending, okay? Le le let's get our sums right. At this particular moment, the free areas of Cyprus have debts to the tune of 18 billion uh, euros. Seven and a half billion euros were, were taken from the Social Security Fund and they're not going to be repaid. So that's debt also. But the government says, forget it, I'm not going to give you money, the money back. So we owe now on net terms, if we take the Social Security out. Who's we? The Republic of Cyprus. The Republic of Cyprus. Mm -hmm. Owes 18 billion. Mm -hmm. Now, that amounts to about 110% of GDP, because our GDP is roughly 17 billion. I've got a note here that I can read for you. Am I allowed to read notes? Sure. As long this as is a note from Mr. Hanan Halidi. I'm, I'm trying to be sorry. It's, it's another note that I, I was going to read for you. I, it's a note from the, it doesn't matter, I know it's fr inside out. The, it's a note from the current, in inverted commas, Minister of Finance of the, in inverted commas, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. In his budget presentation, because they have budgets there also, which right. of course are subsidized by Turkey. He says that in his calculation, the occupied areas owe Turkey 7.5 billion dollars from loans. But we know for a fact that Turkey subsidizes 30% of the operational cost of the Turkish occupied areas for the last 41 years. In my calculation, that's 12 billion. But that's in the, in the shape of a loan, or was it no, no, just no. handouts no, to no. the Turkish Republic? The Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, which is the occupied territory, receives two types of money from Turkey. It receives what they call aid, which Turkey says they don't want it back, and it gives them loans to sustain the civil service. Mm -hmm. So as long as you have loans, to sustain the civil service for 41, 42 nearly years, I, I've done lots, lots of calculations. It amounts to 12 billion. So if you are going to add now 18 billion that we owe, and let's just discount it to 10 billion, it makes 28 billion. The gross domestic product of the two areas now is 20. So we're talking about roughly 180% of GDP, which is an amount no country can repay. Greece owes now 175% of GDP. Now, I've got to add something else. Turkey has built all the infrastructure of the occupied areas. That means they build the roads, they build the um, hospitals, they build schools, administration buildings, and so on and so forth. Now, we did the same here. How did we build it in the free areas? We went to the Kuwait Development Fund. They lent the money to us and we repaid it. Now, instead of going to Kuwait, they went to Turkey. So I'm just asking a legitimate question. Will Turkey donate all the infrastructure work that they have done the moment we had to borrow to, to get the infrastructure. Um, can, I I start, so. can I just no. ask a question? That, 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 by the way, yeah. that amounts, again, in free calculations, to about five billion. Uh, can we just go back to basics? Yeah. Uh, Turkey back. invaded Cyprus contrary to international law. It ethnically cleansed the northern parts of Cyprus contrary to international law. It occupied northern Cyprus for 41 years contrary to international law and it has segregated Cyprus for 41 years, contrary to international law. Is Turkey going to pay any reparations 
for breaking international law for 41 years at no least. No one from the Greek, uh, uh, from, the Cip uh, from the Cypriot government, from the Republic of Cyprus, has ever raised the question of reparations. Why not? They have not raised it because they are scared to raise it. And why are they scared to raise it? Because they have so many other issues to deal with that they don't want to, in inverted commas, complicate the issue even more. But that tells you of the whole situation and the whole ambience of the negotiations, that we are scared to ask for reparations. The moment we know that every single uh, aggressor has to pay the victim reparations in any arrangement. It has never b b been brought up. But the settlement up. doesn't uh, um, indicate that they're aggressors. Or I think it, it goes beyond that. It's a, it's a goodwill settlement for the future. It's not looking back. Uh, at least that's the philosophy of the settlement that, that uh, was given to me to understand. And therefore, uh, that's part of why reparations and other things are not part of this. It's just uh, you, the euphoria of the future, not to, not to destroy that. Yeah, but we have victims here and aggressors. We have 200,000 people that for the last 40 years, they are not getting any income Wait, from the property. Do you think it's a realistic to look forward to such a Con euphoria without dealing with some of the problems of the past and some of the, the baggage that will be carried yeah. uh, into the future with unresolved issues? I think that the current numbers are enough, more than enough, to scuttle any attempt for a bizonal solution in the way they are trying to get it. Because simply numbers do not add up. And if they do not add up, it means that the whole, uh, the whole exercise is not viable. Um, Adis, you've yeah. mentioned a number of statistics. Now, I'm, mm. I'm not an economist, and I'm always skeptical when I hear statistics. OK. <laughs> uh, but I have to ask a very important question. Yeah. How much uh, transparency is there in the, the so-called leader-led process in Nicosia? How much documentation has been brought into the public domain? How many uh, uh, sets of accounts have been uh, produced? Uh, how much um, information is there to enable somebody with your expertise as an ordinary citizen to inspect what is going on so that we can uh, ascertain uh, the economic picture that uh, uh, could okay. unfold in the event of a settlement? Okay. As regards our figures here in the Free Cyprus, the figures, there is no doubt that they are correct. As regards the occupied areas, we have to do triangulation and look into different sources, i.e. sources that are come out of the budget of the Turkish occupied uh, regime, uh, figures that come out of independent, so to speak, uh, st statistical agencies, okay. and figures that come from reports such as the latest report from Arjan's France Press. If you do a triangulation, you can see whether the figures tally and each one agrees. I am happy that the figures that they are all issuing are more or less in the same direction, including in the peace dividend report, they give the figures that we were able to secure via the internet and other sources. Yeah, but ha ha uh, have have the, the, in inverted commas, two leaders in Nicosia produced any sets of accounts or any, any documents from the, the peace process to enable citizens to assess the, the uh, perspective uh, or current economic picture? Do we know how many picture? people live in the north? Yeah. yeah. I mean, do we know how many people yeah. live in the north? Do yeah. we know the assets or liabilities of the illegal regime, for okay. example? Okay. L let's go back to the people. How many people yeah. live there? I have to check that because of the per capita uh. income issues and the uh, equalizing the two economies and rationalizing them and, yeah. uh, and so on and so forth. I saw in the official Turkish occupied government report that the s census which they carried out in 2012 in what they call the major towns, which is Famagusta and uh, Kyrenia and so on and so forth, I tallied the numbers and they say that they have in these towns, I they had in 1912, 200 so which year, which year, sorry? 12. 2012. Yeah, 20, that was census, yeah. the last census we had. That they had 200 uh, residents in these six towns. They have got dozens and dozens of villages also. So when the current negotiators came up with the number the other day saying that they will assume that 
Only 200,000 live in the Turkish areas, occupied areas. How do they compare with the official figures that in only six towns, 200,000 live in there? I didn't see that. They, they said they mentioned the figure? Yes, of course. The negotiators? Yes, it was public. It was made public. Yeah, about the 200,000. But I, I counted 200,000 only in seven towns, what they call towns. Mm. So, well, what about the rest? Who are they, the rest? Agence France but, Press. Uh, but part of the negotiation is that a number of settlers will be accepted. No, no, no. As, no, no, uh, no, no is no, that? Because no, no, no. I'm, I'm not familiar with no, what no. you're talking I'm about. I'm familiar with that. Yeah. This so it doesn't count those. No, no. These are residents, official residents of the occupied areas, mm, mm. in inverted commas, legal residents. Um, okay, J just excuse me. And also in the statistical analysis that some of the uh, um, independent studies uh, issue, they mention the figure of 300,000. Mm. I have not seen any other figure in terms of total being less than 300. Our negotiators keep talking about 200. I think it's all part of the exercise, not to frighten people, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm, this is important because um, in Davos the other day, Mr. Akinji spoke about the formation of a new partnership. But this is yeah. one of their favorite phrases, partnership, a partnership of two communities. Um, in business or in law, um, before you enter into any partnership, you need to conduct proper due diligence measures in accordance with the Latin maxim, caveat emptor, let of the course. buyer beware. So it's very important, in my view, that um, there needs to be full transparency so that the citizens of the Republic of Cyprus know exactly what sort of entity they're going to enter into partnership yeah. with. So I, I come back to the, this question of transparency. Uh, ha, how much draft legislation has been published? Do we know, for example, uh, uh, what, the draft what draft legislation is being drafted on matters to do with, say, banking law, financial services law, the structures of economic governance, the regulation of uh, the banks and the financial services industry, uh, the regulation of the insurance industry. I mean, how, how are these massive parts of the economy going to be regulated? And, and has the draft legislation been published? Certainly, it has not been published. Clearly, we live in darkness in the democratic uh, society that we live in, which is the Republic of Cyprus. I understand that uh, the counterpart in, uh, in the occupied areas spent seven hours presenting and explaining to the so-called parliament what's going on. And then he went into all sorts of societies and explained the thing. Nothing has been done here on this side. So you mean they're more we are transparent in the, dark. in the north than they are in the, the south? Um, significantly more transparent okay. because they have something good to tell them. But we don't have something good to... I mean, hang, on a hang on a second yeah. here. So here we are, we are seeing a secret process taking place uh, with a view to the dissolution of the Republic of Cyprus and its replacement with three states, a federal state, a Greek Cypriot constituent state and a Turkish Cypriot constituent state. And there is no transparency as regards the legislation that has been drafted on matters as important as banking, I th tax, I think financial it's services, a bit and so on. too soon, though, because oh, it's too in, soon. In, in, uh, in all fairness, uh, they're not talking about legislation at the moment. Uh, they're discussing the general uh, parameters. They're not even, they haven't even begun the process of constitutional drafting. Uh, this is, this is uh, haggling at the moment and, and uh, you know, making a deal. Uh, the, they're still in the process of making a deal. We need to be fair. Uh, mm -hmm. They haven't come up with any specific legislation uh, or constitutional provisions or, or anything. Uh, like hang that. On, well, yeah. hang and on. I think I would expect yes. now that once uh, the, the haggling is over and once the deal is cut, then they will move into the process of committing the agreement to paper in terms of constitutional provisions, legislation, and so on. And that, that that process, then, that will be done democratically. Now, that's an open question, though. But when the government says... Sorry, yeah. and it's an open question, I'll tell you why. Because, ideally, 
not ideally, either, but properly, you would have all of that done before you have a referendum, mm. or at least a lot of it done, at least the skeleton part, so that people understand what, what it's all about, so that they understand the fine print. Now, if you jump it and you, you, you uh, uh, do it the opposite way, uh, you have you haggle over an agreement which is secret, mm. okay, for the most part, or some of its provisions are secret, and then you go to a referendum on the climate of because this is what sometimes and most referenda again to be fair this is not uh, referenda weren't invented in Cyprus, okay, they do it in Britain they mm. do it everywhere for and, months in Britain. and there again they create a climate. And it's usually the climate of yes or no, the positive or the negative climate that carries the day. So, now, what does that mean? No, I'm saying that it's important to have these things, but unfortunately, it's, the, the suggestion is that it's not going to happen. Well, so if, can, now, I just, can I just ask a naive question? We're talking about the peace dividend and all of this money that's going to be pumped into Cyprus in the event of a settlement. Well, any foreign investor will want to know, for example, what is going to be the tax code in this entity that I'm being invited to pump money into? What is going Thank to be you. the Thank financial you. services regulatory uh, framework? Uh, uh, you know, the, these again, are surely just, matters just that should be in, in the public ju domain. Just to, just to take a, a page out of the European process, if you remember the whole process of the constitutional uh, uh, restructuring of Europe and the Euro European unification. There was a constitutional conference, there was a draft, etc., and then people either said yes or no in terms of referenda, in terms of parliamentary processes and so on. So I agree with you. I'm just saying that the suggestion that the referendum is going to happen real fast and very fast after the 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 the, uh, uh, the haggling is over, yeah. the secret is. So, and and the secret haggling because we don't know what what they're haggling over uh, is bad. It's bad news. Can I answer the you question? Agree? About the <laughs> Look, I have never seen any person that has good news to hide it. I have seen plenty of people that have terrible news that live in darkness and they keep everybody in darkness. If, if, my, uh, if somebody's uh, daughter were to go out and the parents ask, where are you going? He said, it's none of your business. And don't ask me when I will be returning home. It's quite different than if the girl says, look, I'm going to go out to a coffee shop with three of my friends. I'll be back in one hour. So all these hidden uh, um, uh, negotiations, all these uh, um, um, absence of light, right. this absence of su sunlight on this process doesn't augur well. Can I just ask, yeah. uh, ask a question? So, do, uh, let's take the, to go back to the investment. Let's legislation. just take tax legislation, or yeah. financial services legislation yeah. for, for these three states that are going to come into existence. Is this legislation going to be drafted before the referendum and presented to the public as a fait accompli? Or will there be a referendum? They'll then create these three new states and then hope for the best and then draft the three, okay. uh, the three uh, the, sets of legislation? I don't know. But if Anan, the Anan plan is yeah. any guide, which was 9,000 pages and was thrown at us and we were given a couple of weeks to read 9,000 pages, if you give this to any independent, fair-minded person and tell him that somebody threw at the common man of Cyprus 9,000 pages that was uh, done in secrecy and asked him to vote, he will tell you that this is suspect. But, and this is what I, but I must answer the question on uh, investment. Ahead. Okay. Mm. So uh, Glenn was... Uh, uh, let's stay one minute on, on okay. this, on the Anan <laughs> plan. All right. A lot of the material, though, that was, that was agreed, agreed on or drafted for the Anan plan, my understanding is that it's going to be grafted onto this new uh, settlement if the settlement goes through because they're not going to go through a lot of it a lot of the 9000 pages uh, again to be fair was technical stuff yeah that you're going to have it anyway uh, because it's irrespective it's, it still needs to be in the public domain i agree and subject to line by line scrutiny yeah. i agree i agree right. but what what i think is is 
sometimes that we we bring forward, and I think that's an important thing to think about, is the intentions. If, it, if there are good intentions in our politicians and our leaders, uh, you have to credit them with good intentions. They're trying to do the good thing or the right thing. So l l l give us the uh, papers and we'll tell you if, the, if we the, agree. The question, though, is why do they, if they're trying to do the right thing, why so much That's secrecy? The That's the question. Right. Can I? I know you wanted to. Do you want to just say something about yeah, investment? I've got, but I've got a very important investment. question. Okay. To, uh, should we deal with yeah. the, with the sure. follow-up question now? Yeah. Okay. To do with the secrecy, um, I, I don't know what's going on in secret at the moment. All I know is that there's secrecy. If there's a settlement, the likelihood is I may be wrong, and I hope I'm wrong. But if there's a settlement, the likelihood is that this secrecy we're seeing at present is going to spill over into the new state of affairs. Naturally, uh, yeah. Now, we know from um, history that where you have secrecy, you have corruption or the increased risk of corruption. Uh, could you maybe comment on the, the, the interlinkage between secretive governance and corruption? And uh, allied to that, the, 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 the degree to which this new state of affairs will be exposed to the risk of corruption. Okay. Let me go first. Back to the investment. Okay. Christodoulos raised the question at the very beginning of the exercise, saying that plenty of investments will uh, be pouring into Cyprus and so on and so forth. I presume we are talking about <coughs> international investors. The only system that looks like the one that they are trying to, to market in this country is the Bosnian constitution. So Bosnia can be a fantastic reference as regards what we call foreign direct investment, which is the figure of money coming in, but not including deposits and financial things, because that's not investment. It's just deposit in the bank. Bosnia, in the last 10 years, on average, had an FDI of 200 million. That's the cost of an expensive building and nothing more, nothing less. Cyprus, that is still operating as a republic, had half a billion, i.e. 500 million in the last year. So I'm saying, in my mind, you know, they're very uh, shrewd and very cunning international investors. There are 195 countries in the world now that a businessman can invest. So I'm asking the question, this shrewd businessman that relies on statistics and data and political risk and country risk and so on and so forth, when he has some money to invest, will he go into a country that will be run with vetoes, that will be partitioned, that will have two ministers deciding, it will have two presidents. Three, three, three ministers. Three, three ministers three. deciding, precisely. It will have three uh, oh, internal affairs ministers and so on and so forth. It will have about, um, we have 45 municipalities, and they have 29. So if you add them, we're talking about 80 municipalities for a population of 1 million, roughly. The moment sh Greater Chicago is about 8 million, they have one municipality. So wh wh uh, who is going to come in his right mind to invest money in a deadlocked economy where you will have vetoes? Can I, can I if somebody tells me that, yeah. The vetoes are there, but they will not be exercised. I say, thank you very much. If they are not going to be exercised, let's not put them into the agreement. The vetoes are there because they are intended to be exercised. Can I, just, just, yeah. to, just, just to clarify, yeah. so, so everyone understands, yeah. uh, if, again, if the Annan plan I is any guide, uh, we'll have, um, f depending on how you calculate it, four or five levels of government in, in an island with a population of no more than one million or so. You'll have the uh, three branches of government in the Greek Cypriot constituent state, the three branches of government in the Turkish Cypriot constituent state, the three branches of government in the federal state. You'll have the, three, the, the three sets of public sectors across the three states. You'll have the, the organs of government in the two uh, British sovereign base areas. And underneath all of this, you'll have municipal government. So this is yeah, a recipe 80 for of them, uh, 75 of them. Uh, I was going to uh, I'll yeah. come back to corruption later, but this is a bloated uh, state of affairs in the making. Who's going to pay for it and how much is it going to cost?
But I'm saying now, talking of investment, who is going to come into a country let that has to sustain you. through taxations? Let, right. you know, Adi, uh, how much is it going to cost to pay for these structures? Leave the British out for the moment. How much is it going to cost to operate three public sectors? Yeah. And who's going to pay for it? I think that more important than the cost is the dysfunctionality, okay. which is more than the cost. Because if now Cyprus rates 110th, I think, out of 166 countries, in terms of uh, ease to do business and to get, get through things. Let me give you an example. The other day, a foreign investor came and he said that if you give me state land to the tune of 450 acres, I'm going to invest 2 billion or whatever, he said, in Cyprus. Okay, let's assume now that we have a bizonal solution with uh, up teenth governments and semi-governments and uh, extensions of governments. And th this same foreign investment comes and says, look, I'm going to, to invest $2 billion and I want the government to give me 450. Let me tell you what's going to happen. The first thing that will happen is that the occupied area, which would, will then become the Turkish uh, state, will say no. We're not going to allow you to get land as long as you are going to get it there in the, uh, in the Greek uh, sector. We won't allow you, we'll veto it. If you want to build a project of two billion, you better come and build it on our side. Otherwise, we will not give you a permit okay. to do that because we can veto it. But, but look, yeah. I think we're, we're overstepping it a little bit because okay. decisions of this type uh, may be made, and I, from what I understand, will be able to be made by the two separate states uh, and therefore in answer to your question this is state to, land uh, there is no state land no, no, in no, the no, states no no i'm telling I'm, I'm saying in terms of investment let's say of building uh, uh, property on uh, on private land okay, it's not, not private land this is state land no, 450 no, no, yes, acres I'm of state I'm not talking land. about this case. I'm the giving case. you a practical case yeah, that fine, happened yesterday. Fine, but I'm, I, I don't know about this case. Now, I'm, I'm suggesting to you that one of the countries that will invest and people will invest will be Turkey. Mm. Naturally. Turkey has proven that it wants to invest and has invested very heavily in the north. It yeah. will continue to do so. Absolutely. Now, uh, another side to the f three governments and how many other municipalities, the, the EU regulations will still be accepted by the federal government and, and uh, define uh, the activities of the federal government, but also of the two state uh, government. So that's another positive issue. Uh, again, why would somebody come to invest? Because with the peaceful um, uh, resolution of the disputes in, in, uh, in the region, uh, Cyprus can uh, have good relations with Turkey. It can, uh, you know, uh, doors will be open. At least this is whose doors will be open. Our doors or Turkey's certain, doors? Well, that's that's for you to tell us because this is what I, I'm just repeating. Okay. Some of the um, some of the suggestions that are put forward that should be convincing and are convincing a lot of people. Now, uh, are they are they wrong? Are they misled and so and so on? This is, this is part of what we're, we should be okay. trying to do today. I have written an article on this issue of uh, Turkey versus Cyprus investment in case of a solution and so forth. Assuming that everything goes well, which is not going to go well. That's, that's a, a priori statement. Turkey's minimum wage now stands at 424 euros. Cyprus's minimum wage stands at 942 euros. So there is a difference of 500 euros in the minimum wage. I give you the minimum wage because the minimum wage is indicative of many things. So I'm asking, who is going to export to whom? Is the country with the minimum wage of 400 going to be more expensive than the country with 925 or 24 or the opposite? What I'm assuming is that Turkey will inundate the market here and will knock out anyone that has to do with clothing, with uh, shoes, with whatever it is, that can be produced mass pr production of consumer goods. Now, let's go to agriculture. Turkey has 
piped in water, which they are not sharing yet, right. because of money considerations. And Turkey, Turkey's um, exports in agricultural products, if I remember well, is roughly 50 billion of agricultural products. Turkey is a powerhouse in agriculture. So are we going to be able to compete with Turkish agricultural products the moment our cost of production is twice or three times the cost of production of Turkey? The answer is no. So we're going to become net importers. Agriculture requires three things. Cheap water, which Turkey has and we don't have. Cheap labor, which Turkey has and we don't have. And lots of land, cheap land, which we don't have and Turkey has. So two industries now, manufacturing and agriculture, will be wiped out the next morning. So all these stories about opening up the Turkish market is all propaganda. I remember this uh, um, example I'll give you now so clearly that when China opened up about uh, two, 25 years ago, somebody who was manufacturing uh, clothes in Cyprus, he came to me and he said that we have good news for Cyprus. China's market is being open, he said. And I expect one of every hundred Chinese to be wearing a Cypriot shirt. So I told him that I suspect that every other Cypriot will be wearing a Made in China shirt. So 25 years later, we don't have a single shirt exported to China because it's cheaper there to produce. And we are all wearing Made in China shirts, except the aristocrats so, uh, yeah. of, of Cyprus. <laughs> So I, 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 are you suggesting that if there is, in inverted commas, a peace dividend, that Turkey we'll will be Turkey the primary dividend. beneficiary? Of course. Okay. I mean, it, it, it's, it's another argument that they, they threw out, which is really laughable, is saying that um, we are going to export, and, uh, um, rather uh, import, export, <laughs> whatever, tourists, and we're going to get uh, a, 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 um, an exchange of tourists from Turkey. I think that's ludicrous because a tourist that will decide between Cyprus and Turkey with, and then spend one day between his holidays visiting the other country is going to go to the big country and spend 15 days and maybe take a boat and come and have lunch in Cyprus for a day. So therefore, even the tourists that we're getting are more likely to go to Turkey because you, they don't have to spend 15 days to see Cyprus. They can see Cyprus over a couple of days. But if they go to Turkey, they need months before they can see Turkey. So they have a better product. They have cheaper services. They have better packages. <coughs> so I'm, I'm just saying, if, if it's open, uh, as they say, the, the tourism uh, uh, flow, will it be in the direction of Turkey or here? Uh, can, I, can I just, uh, as we're discussing yeah. Turkey, uh, I, I mentioned corruption earlier. I want yeah. to uh, maybe come back to this. I have, in, I have in front of me here the Transparency International uh, Overview of Corruption and Anti-Corruption in Turkey, uh, published in the year 2014. And, and among other things, Transparency International reports that Turkey faces high levels of corruption. Of course. Uh, accordingly, the government has taken steps to reduce corruption in the country. However, despite limited uh, progress, the country continues to be confronted with challenges of rampant corruption and existing anti-corruption measures are still in question. Interestingly, the report adds, one of the main criticisms is the lack of a, co of a coordinated and strategic approach to anti-corruption. There is also an absence of transparency and accountability in the political system as embodied in the immunity regulations for high-ranking officials. Okay. Now, the question therefore is, if there is a settlement and if a post-settlement Cyprus is integrated economically with Turkey to a far greater extent than the Republic of, of will Cyprus be. is yeah. at present, is the post-settlement Cyprus going to be exposed to the contamination that will flow from the corruption that is rampant in Turkey? My quick answer is yes, because when, they, when we have one supposedly unitary state, all these assessments that are done, by central banks and by all sorts of bodies. They take the country as a whole. They don't take parts or towns of a, of a, of a country. In other words, I'm not going to come and say that there is corruption in Nicosia, but not in Limassol. 
they, are going, they all take the countries. So when the Global Competitive Index comes here to study, it's going to study Cyprus. When the Transparency International comes, it's going to study Cyprus. It's not going to study a unit of Cyprus. Therefore, if one of the two units is corrupt, it's going to carry in the corruption process the other unit, whether we like it or not. Today, there are absolutely no rules as regards the banking of the Turkish occupied areas, the banking system. Ours is collapse. So who is going to control the banks? Is there going to be one central bank that will take directions well, sure. from, from, yeah, the, yeah, from that, the... That's from what's supposed to happen. Supposed yeah. to happen. Yeah. Okay. You know what they say? They say that if there is one central bank, first of all, they don't want one central bank. They want to have two central banks. But if there's going to be one central bank, there should be two governors of the banks. Mm. Mm. A deadlock. Deadlock. <laughs> and, 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 and it means in deadlock, the powerful side, which will be the uh, Turkey, basically, which will be running the thing, calls the shots, not the weak side. Yeah, but if it's yeah. under Euro and the Euro is on both sides, then it is the, the, the European Central Bank which essentially rules uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the, the, the country central banks are just uh, executing orders. Yeah. They're not... Uh, so can you please, uh, could somebody explain to me the moment we were under the European uh, Central Bank, how come we ended up bankrupting the whole um, financial system without the Central Bank of Europe getting an idea before before that happened. Well, supposedly they're, they're learning from their mistakes. They are learning from their mistakes. So I can we. guarantee you that the banks in the occupied areas, when they become uh, ter Turkey proper, they are going to link up with Turkish banks. They are not going to have anything to do with us. Mm. They will either become subsidiaries or, or uh, outlets mm. of Turkish banks. Well, th this just th this underlines my point of a few moments ago. We need to have the draft constitutional and legislative instruments in the public domain so we can see how the banks are going to be regulated, how they're going to be uh, overseen, how, they're going, how, how, how the financial services authorities are going to function, how the ombudsman are going to function. Uh, it, for me, this is, this is extremely serious and it, it's, an, it's an illustration of, of, of why Cyprus is really not a proper democracy because we are operating, or, or from what I can see, all this secrecy is, is deeply troubling and, and it's, if, they're, if they're operating in secret before a settlement, I come back to my question of, of earlier, if they're operating in secret before a settlement, is this giving us an insight into the secrecy that may flourish after a settlement? And if, so, <laughs> and if so, to take it one step further, is secrecy a friend or enemy of corruption? Secrecy is a, the greatest friend of corruption. Why? Because whenever you have a crime, you try to, 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 to control it by not letting out any information and cover up and so on and so forth. And that's why our, uh, because of the various secrecies that were happening in this country, we, we got our economic system uh, into such great yeah, trouble. Yeah, because yeah. nobody was telling anyone what I mean, was happening. I mean, I, asked, I, I, I hope... Uh, I'll repeat a question I've asked before. Uh, in the secret negotiations in Nicosia, are they composing freedom of information legislation? Will there be a constitutional guarantee of freedom of information? But Will there be a freedom of information act uh, well, built answer, into the settlement? My quick answer would be that how can a, a, a body that's secretive, <laughs> like, like the Masons, be open later. <laughs> I mean, if you're yeah, but, if secretive, I, I, you're going to have secretive arrangements. I, I, secretive I mean, we, we don't know. We don't know because, because we're, we, we're kept in, in the dark. In all fairness to the Masons, uh, the, the, at the moment, the secrecy, <laughs> the secrecy is, is in the negotiating process. I don't think you can, you can uh, guarantee that there'll be, or does that guarantee that there'll be secrecy built into the political system? Uh, I think that's, I'm that's sorry. a bridge too far, I think, for us uh, to make that uh, conclusion. Yeah. But well, well, we do, we only one side is secretive, the other is not secretive. Well, there the you other, go. The other side therefore, shares, therefore, shares with its constituents the, the, everything that's the, happening I mean, here. The, can, I just, can I just say, the, yeah. the, the, uh, the key, one of the keys, of, of fact, if you just have a look at the, the um, uh, Transparency International list of corrupt uh, or perceived corrupt regimes, right at the bottom is North Korea which is the most secretive society on earth. 
Towards the top, I think it's in fourth position, is Sweden. Sweden has, unless I'm mistaken, the oldest freedom of information legislation That's in the world. Yeah. So it's a simple equation. Uh, transparency equals less corruption. Secrecy equals more corruption. I, I ask Mr. Ryder and Mr. Akinji and Mr. Anastasiades to make a statement tomorrow or next week clarifying whether or not there's going to be a constitutional guarantee of freedom of information built into the Constitution, and if not, is there going to be a Freedom of Information Act governing all three states? Or, uh, to put it another way, will there be three Freedom of Information Acts? That, for me, is going to be the key to whether or not there's going to be transparency in the new state of but, affairs. But certainly, uh, the, the Turkish Cypriots will guarantee, since they're more uh, transparent and democratic than, than, well, the, than the Greek that's side, what our they, history there's says. certainly a guarantee that that would happen. I'm just of joking. They, they, I'm they, just joking. Uh, now, uh, of, they are free we, with the information because they have good news to yeah, tell their people. Uh, our, our side is not free with information because they have horrible news let, to tell their people. Let me switch tack for a second because we're yeah. running out of time. Margaret Thatcher said that the only peace dividend is peace. Yeah. Now, even if you uh, take away all the possibilities yeah. of economic benefit and all of that, isn't it enough that we're going to have peace? Isn't that good enough to have a settlement? You can have peace in many ways. You can be subjugated and have peace. You can come under the control of a foreign aggressor and have peace if you, if you are silent. You can separate the country into two entities and keep quiet the moment the country doesn't work and you can have peace. And you can have peace under democratic, liberal democracy. Mm. So if we have peace in the way that Sweden has peace, the way that uh, Norway has peace, the way that England has peace, and so on and so forth, yes. But if we are going to have peace, because we are going to sign a surrender instrument mm. where we deliver lock, stock and barrel, the Republic of Cyprus and all the rights of the, of, of the people that have been here for the last three and a half thousand years, then thank you very much. I don't want that kind of peace. And especially, I guess, you would agree yeah. we shouldn't trade freedoms for economic benefits Naturally, that yeah. are never going to come. Can I, can I just come in here? Because there are two very important points I want, I want to just make. Firstly, you mentioned freedom. Bizonality is the antithesis of freedom of because bizonality rests on the formation of two zones. A zone is inextricably associated with yeah. restrictions. So I just put it in the form of a question. Uh, how can you have a free market? How can you have free trade? How can you have free movement of persons with bizonality? So straight away, bizonality yeah. negates freedom. But the, the second point I want to make, and I, I will close my, my contribution to the discussion with this thought, that we mentioned at the beginning the peace dividend. And I'm a law, I've got a law background, and I, I always like looking at the origins of words that emerge from the lips of politicians and diplomats. And I looked up the, the origin of the word dividend, and it has the same root as the word divide. The root of the word dividend is the Latin verb dividere, meaning to divide. And that, for me, encapsulates what is philosophically wrong with bicommunal, bizonal federation. It's an instrument of division, and the peace dividend, if there is one, will result in the division of money, and that will produce deadlock. I, I, I think it, it's meant in, in the view. sense of, of share, as in share a dividend. But uh, coming to share, sharing, yeah. we haven't mentioned the hydrocarbon issue, yeah. and that's the the uh, knight uh, in shining armor that's going to come and rescue us all. Yeah. Uh, w what's your comment? A quick uh, last comment on the hydrocarbons. If there is democracy in Cyprus, and I don't see any democracy coming to Cyprus, I see division mm. and, and trouble and uh, all sorts of conflicts coming with the Greek Cypriots basically leaving the country in due course. If there is democracy, yes, there's going to be a lot of money coming in from the uh, energy resources of the island. Eventually. Eventually, and if the prices change and so on, because it's a very competitive sure. area. But as things stand now, if we go forward with a bi-zonal and whatever it is, and be become a dependency of Turkey, right. 
we are not going to see any of the energy resources. Everything will be controlled by Turkey. And Turkey will give us whatever it wishes and whatever it feels that w we should have. We will, we will not have control of, of energy resources because with the vetoes, and that's a, a central government issue. Yeah. Central governments will be all vetoes. Uh, they, they won't call them vetoes. They didn't call them vetoes in the Annan plan, unless I'm mistaken. No, no, it's vetoes now. No, they won't call them vetoes, but, but they will vetoes. in substance it's, be it's vetoes. vetoes. Yeah. With the vetoes that the occupied areas will have, the Turkish yeah. country, because it's going to be a Turkish territory from there on, they will never ever allow us to do anything which is sensible, which is meritocratous, or which is sound, unless Turkey approves it. Yeah. Because they will throw in the vetoes. So w we, for example, say, l let's assume that we're going to sell the petroleum to, to uh, Egypt, for example, the energy resources to Egypt. And they say, no, we should have a, a pipeline going to Turkey and then from Turkey going to Europe. We say, no, we disagree. So we either have a stalemate, which means nothing happens, and therefore we get nothing out of the of the energy resources, or we agree with their terms and we send it to Turkey and they control the, the flow of all these uh, 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 financially rewarding resource that we'll never be able to touch. Vetoes, I have written articles on this, I have written all sorts of things. Vetoes are going to paralyze the central government and deliver us to Turkey because Turkey will be doing all the decisions and taking decisions on our behalf. Otherwise, nothing will happen. So we'll have two choices. Either stalemate, meaning that we suffer because we are not going to benefit from any revenues, or we accept Turkish, uh, Turkish conditions. Yeah. I'm afraid, gradually, we're going to go to accepting Turkish conditions until we leave the island. Well, That's my opinion. Yeah. So uh, can we leave uh, with uh, a, a trying yeah. always on a positive vote? Yeah, that, let's, uh, let's leave that with a positive vote. if the peace dividend, the components are democracy, freedom, and justice. Mm. Which is not. Uh, and the rule of that law. would be a good thing in itself. Yeah. And then if, and that would perhaps guarantee, uh, not guarantee, but help an economic uh, aspect of uh, a peace uh, okay. settlement. I'll give but you that's not a guarantee. No, I'll give you three figures. I think that the, uh, we, 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 we need to yeah, wrap up. Th yeah. That will settle the case. Norway, that's a democracy, has a per capita GDP of 67,000 euros. Bosnia, that's another Cyprus revisited, <laughs> has four because they have bisonality. Right. Lebanon, that's run on vetoes, has nine. And Norway, that's a democracy. And Denmark and the US and Sweden, etc., they have about 60,000. So that okay. tells you so we either have a democracy and we have a high economic dividend or we have a bizonal dividend and we get into poverty until we leave this place. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting and me and thank, thank you for you. the um, lovely uh, interaction we had. Thank you, Aris. Thank you.